Howdy doody dandy people. Uh, super excited. We got the Grit Games in West Columbia, Texas, which is basically Houston this weekend. It was originally going to be me, Victor, Victor Quesada, and Bracken teaming up to take down the team competition, but Bracken has been overwhelmed with excitement about his, uh, his housing situation that he forgot to purchase a flight. So Mr. Brackentech is not going to be joining us. <laughs> He's going. I mean, let's let's say what it really is. You know, I'm afraid to get beat by Benny in the ring challenge. Ooh, ooh. You know, I wasn't going to say it. To. I wasn't going to say it. But if you want to, ducking you, Benny. <laughs> so, guys, Grit Games is going to be live on the Facebook page, uh, Grit Fitness, and there's a lot of Grit Fitnesses out there. So we'll put the link to watch it live. The competition is on Sunday. And I'll put the link in the show notes to watch it. Uh, tune in. It's a super cool event. It's five events throughout the day. So it starts at 8 in the morning, goes till 7 p.m. at night. We're not going the whole time, honestly. But um, chime in. You'll be able to see the live competitions. It's really cool. It's ridiculously brutal. And, uh, yeah, I think our third is going to be Miles Keller replacing Brack Attack. So if I say that and Miles doesn't end up being our third, then sorry for whoever ends up being our third. But um, Bracken's raising his hand like he's in class. Yeah, I didn't know if you were going to wrap this segment up real quick, and I wanted to get attention. And Mr. Gifford, uh, that, <laughs> that segues into the next uh, announcement. I'm also not going to be attending NORAM. I am, I'm out for that as well. I have not been able to run since Savage on Saturday. Why? The next morning I went for a run. I had significant foot and knee pain and didn't run the next two days and tried – yesterday and couldn't and today i tried every different incline possible on my treadmill and biking and uh the knee combined with the foot uh mostly knee right now yesterday with foot was worse I, I can't run right now i don't know what's going on so i got i'm going in to see someone uh, i couldn't get a hold of them today so i have to call back tomorrow and get this sorted out but i don't know it's really frustrating yeah, that sounds like it. That's really unfortunate. I hope it's just something like you tweak something and so the muscles around the tweak are just irritated and they need to calm down. But definitely I definitely tendon in the knee. Oh definitely tendon in the foot. Well but I don't have a single moment I can point to. I rolled my ankle twice in the race in the first mile. Not bad enough to really like it hurt, but it didn't affect anything. It just mm -hmm. it's one of those like, oh, I can't believe that really. And then you get back to running. Man. And it was the other foot. It's the other side of the body. These, this knee and this foot were not part of any jarring motion that I can recall during the race. And yet the next day I woke up and ever since I've been in increasingly worse, um, I guess, pain. Discomfort. Call it. Yeah. And it's definitely beyond that. So, huh. well, I don't know. I'm hoping for a quick adjustment and suddenly like you're fixed, but I, I will not be racing for the next two weeks for sure. That is unfortunate. Uh, some silver lining is, you know, you've got a long time before the stadium series wraps up to heal. Um, I have eight and a half weeks until, or nine weeks till Tahoe, which means like five, five or six until West Virginia. Yep. And then other silver lining is good thing you didn't buy a flight for Gert Games because then you would have been coming even with a hurt foot. Sure. Or just Downside of this no silver lining is that I just took an entire week off. Yeah. And yeah. then started running again and ran Savage, and now I'm on my way to another week off. So inopportune time, but we're going to stay positive and try to get this thing back on track. Well, not to I, – I hadn't decided if I was going to talk about this or not, but I, I might as well, um, just so people understand. My season is effectively over. Um, I had – a whole lot of dental work done uh, about four weeks ago and unfortunately one of the implants failed i woke up yesterday morning and so there's a screw in there that has to heal for six weeks and then they put the tooth on in the screw well the screw is bouncing around which is not supposed to happen believe it or not so i have to go back they have to redo it and then the six weeks recovery period starts again from that point and that point in time will not be until the end of august so uh, that rolls very obviously into October, and I can't really justify spending a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars to go over to Worlds um, in London to have a completely half-assed week performance. Because um, where I'm at right now is where I'll be for Worlds, and right now in my recovery process from the dental surgery, I can barely maintain a nine-minute mile pace without my heart rate being in the tempo zone. Uh, I weigh 155 pounds, which is 
like 15 pounds lighter than I've weighed in two years. Uh, and in general, it's not, I mean, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I, I can't do anything about it. It happened, which means that the universe or God or whatever you want to put a stamp on it says that something better is going to happen instead. So I'll be going, I'll be doing grit games. Uh, nor am I'll be doing because I've already paid for everything. So I'll be there. I'm, I'll see what I can do, but I'm going to go with no pressure and, and just have a good time. And then after that, kind of in the back seat for uh, all the way until, uh, I guess, is it Fenway? Fenway, yeah. Fenway in November. So well, that's us. Uh, great games. Wow. Blah, blah, blah. A lot of wow, wow. Uh, and then let's finish the rest of the introduction. Welcome to the ObstacleDominator.com podcast featuring Benny Gifford and Bracken Crocker. Whether you want to dominate your next obstacle race or just get started in obstacle racing, you're about to discover every tactic you need to know from gear to training to nutrition. Get the latest tips from the trenches, get your questions answered, and show up at your next obstacle race ready to dominate. And now, here's Benny and Bracken. Bracken Crocker here. This is the Obstacle Dominator podcast. And let me introduce to you, Benjamin Gifford. Good morning, Vietnam! That's what Bracken was supposed to do, but instead he was like, I'm going to take the professional route and make Benny look like, what is that, insensitive? What do we call that? No, that wouldn't be insensitive unless you were Vietnamese and did not like mornings. <laughs> okay, dude, that reminds me. <laughs> That reminds me on the set of Broken Skull Challenge. I told the dumbest joke that happens to be about Mexicans, but is 0% stereotypical or racist. Like there's as much connection as Vietnamese people and good mornings. And one of the, um, I was talking to my, I told my teammate that. And the, one of the camera guys overheard it, and I, I overheard it. And right when our interview was done, he goes, hey, I don't appreciate that joke. And I was like, yeah, I know, it kind of sucked. And he's like, no, that was racist as shit. And I was like, wait, what? How? And he was like, and he just started swearing at me and called me a racist, just all kinds of crazy. How did he know you weren't Mexican or Hispanic of some sort? I know. I'm like, dude, I look like some kind of Latin or Hispanic. Like, he well, Benny. well, he didn't know what my, well, maybe he knew what my name was. I don't know. Anyways, can you tell a joke? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Can 100%. You let the audience make their decision? Yeah. I made this up when I was like 14. I tell everybody well, I know. It yeah. So it's, that, that adds some extra juice to it. What do you call a Mexican with a rubber toe? Rubber toe. Interesting. I've yeah. heard that joke. A I know. A girl I knew in high school named Cassie used to tell that joke amongst many others that were all pretty much like the early version of a dad joke. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I've told like everybody, somebody told me that joke one time and I was like, ah, oh, it's circulating. Well, the word Mexican is offensive to you. It's, it would be strange because it's no different than American. It's just like the word retarded. Even if you are literally. Oh, that's a little no, different. No, 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 no. Even if you're using it properly, you still can't use the word retarded. Like, if you are using it to its definition, you still can't use it. It's like a it's like a power play. Um, anyway, except that there's no. <laughs> <laughs> ah. No, 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 there's it's like Jew. Like Jew just sounds derogatory. But I'm Jewish, so if you call me a Jew, then I'm Jewish. But if you go you Jew, then it's like okay, what do, what were you really saying there? Um, okay, I think that's the better. <laughs> 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 now, anyways, episode 18, um, we are chatting with Tyler Veerman, and uh, main thing is to say we got the Obstacle Dominator training guide coming out in August. We're going to give you guys a sneak peek as to what that looks like, a little piece of the training on next episode, and uh, there's going to be a cool little aspect to it that's never been on any of them before, and it's going to be a good time, but without making this, inter or this uh, intro any longer, don't say it, Bracken, we're going to... We're going to uh, breaststroke right into this. Let's slip into the waters. Let's <laughs> slip into the waters. Here we go. So big news out of the OCR world. Two big things this week. Uh, the first kind of has been building gigantic momentum for months now, but the CrossFit Games are upon us. And that means Hunter McIntyre, patron saint of this show, is about to finally get the chance to either prove himself or the Legion's of people hoping for a downfall for him correct and he's gonna he's gonna compete and i i could not be more excited for the crossfit games and i think this is exactly 
why they allowed people like Hunter in. Because whether you want him to succeed or fail, people are waiting for these games more than they typically would be. Yep, I agree. I agree. And it's not that the games did not have a diehard watching audience already, but Hunter has brought a new audience and he has even brought in a new audience from within the CrossFit community, the haters, because now they're watching, you know, the same people we're going to watch regardless of if Hunter was there or not, but he's just brought from the OCR world and from CrossFit people from both realms to watch uh whether it's to watch him fail like you said or to watch him kick ass it's pretty funny i was talking to yancey culp about this the other night and he's like hunter has an entire sport in his corner like (laughs) the entire if you're from obstacle course racing even if you had kind of a level-headed comment of you know hunter i I really don't know how good you're gonna do here but i'm rooting for you man you're still on his side and most of them are just diehard the sheriff is gonna crush skulls you know stuff like that so i'm ridiculously excited to see what they're going to do first of all with the format being different this year like they've never had it to where you are eliminated from events it's just been you place better or worse in the top 50 now it's like 50 percent of people are eliminated i think in the first event and then from there they just keep going so uh, i'm excited to see if they try and take deliberate stabs at getting hunter out i don't think they're going to but um my estimation is uh he lands top 12 and uh that's my estimation what about you hunt or <laughs> <laughs> I am looking bulky. I can understand. That's true. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I have a hard time predicting this one. I would say that he finishes up top 16. Um, it, it wouldn't shock me if he goes top eight, top six, but I think that he's just going to have too many events where he finishes very low, balanced out by, by several events that he wins and goes top five. Um, but so I'm going to say top 16, 16 is the over under for him in my book. But what I'm excited for is, is I've watched the games every year since they've been available to watch um, on some sort of streaming or replay. I've watched the documentaries about them. I love them. I love competitions. I, I'll watch any sport, but CrossFit's a pretty awesome experience to watch. And I love it. And one thing that they've never had in any of the documentaries, in any of the live streams, in any of the shows is interpersonal drama. Never. The closest they've had is one year they had all these people talking about how terrible it is to do drugs and you should never, ever do it. And then one of those people tested positive like two weeks later. And then they got a few reactions afterwards. But like for the most part, they've never had anything other than like genuine politeness or fake politeness towards each other. They just don't have it. And this year they're going to have it. And I don't love drama, but I love like watching friction and I love watching people compete with more than just like genuine love for each other. I like to see people throw down because they can't wait to crush the guy next to them or more for a personal reason. And Hunter brings that immediately to these games and it's going to be a blast to watch. And it's, I'm personally interested to see how much of it they show and how much of it they try to like entice and play up. Like, are they going to put a mic in his face and then in Fikowski's face, or are they going to try to keep it like, Oh no, he's not a, He's not some sideshow that's here. He's just anyone else we're not going to play it up. Yeah. Hunter, I don't think they're going to do that because, like you said, they haven't really had a person that is entertaining to watch for any reason other than the fact that they're a phenomenal athlete. Maybe Sarah Sigmund's daughter has a strong personality. Everyone else is kind of like, meh. You know, they're, they're, they're incredible athletes, but not that enticing to watch aside from that. And I think they are because I've seen them in other venues. Some of them are dynamic personalities, but the status quo of the games has been professional. Mm. And as a result, no one has come into it with an entertainment mindset. They've come in with a perform only mindset. And I wonder what's going to happen when that gets broken during yep. these games. Are athletes going to stoop to that, so to speak? Are they going to be rattled by it? Or are they going to embrace it and go nuts? Is it going to throw them off their game? I can't wait to see it. I learned this uh, other dimension of competing and uh, our job, I don't know about our job, but our ability to take the role of an entertainer and a competitor from watching Hunter on season one of Spartan Ultimate Team Challenge. We're sitting on this hillside while we're filming and everyone is dying. This was like a raw Hunger Games, like kill each other type experience and everyone's just fighting to survive. Everyone's all in the camera and stuff. And Hunter, then again, he was dealing with a team that was less fit than him so he could be more conscious throughout the whole thing. But they're climbing this wall. Everyone's bloody. And he's shouting at the crowd and going, ah! and he's having a party while doing all this. And I'm looking at him thinking, 
this man knows how to have a good time even while he's pushing and competing. And uh, <laughs> I'm crazy excited to see, like you say, what it brings out of the other competitors, uh, if it phases them, if it doesn't, because like you said, it's been all professional from here. But that's enough about the games. Uh, the other big piece of news is not such a happy one. And let, let, let's wait. Let's see if our guest can guess what we're about to say. Hmm. Okay. Well, we've got we've got Tyler Veerman on right now. Tyler, do you know what we're about to talk about? Um, my performance in Utah. Oh, <laughs> I like self-deprecating humor, Tyler. I do. <laughs> this is worse than that. Believe it or not, this is worse. I'm not sure. What is it? We're talking about uh, one of the original big three going under Warrior Dash, closing their doors. Oh, yeah. I just heard about that. Uh, given the entries to uh, Spartan Race? Or, oh, I don't know Spartan how Race is giving entries to Warrior Dash Spartan registrants. Race. Which, which they seem to do anytime anyone goes under. <laughs> which I think is a, it's a great move. I don't care if people are like, it's just a way to get their demographic. I don't yeah, care. Everyone's going to be going after the demographic. You don't act like that's a sleazy move. That's an awesome move. And actually, I'm pretty excited because I bought four Warrior Dash entries to a race here in Dallas because I was going to go with my family, and they ended up canceling out the race. So I have four free Spartan races now <laughs> that I can nice. just fan. This isn't like hitting on a widow at a funeral. You know, this this is this is this is a business. Of course, they're going to go after their their fan base you would be a bad businessman not to. Spartan did this with the last, who was the last one that went under that they did it with? Was it Tough yeah. Mudder X participants yeah. or whatever it was? Mm -hmm. well, Tough Mudder canceled the East Coast venue and immediately Spartan's like, yeah, yeah, we'll give you a free entry. Come to ours instead. We're not going to cancel. Yeah. I think it's genius. It's an, I'd be it's, pissed off if I was the other company, but it's genius. Well, they're going under. What else? I mean, unless they're going to attempt to, you know, retain that demographic and form something else, kind of like Battlefrog did, where they let their name be bought out by some tiny race company, and they gave them their website and their social media. Unless they had that in their business plan, which they would have executed on already, then what are they going to do? They're going under. They can't do anything with that asset. Um, Tyler, did you ever do one? Um, yeah, I did one. I think they had one at Copper. Copper Mountain. Yeah, they did. Uh, and I, I believe I saw Killian for the first time there. That was one of the only mountainous warrior dashes in the world. Really? Yeah. From what I've heard, it was one of the best warrior dash courses ever. Oh yeah, it was. It was pretty fun. I mean, uh, I did. I did a few laps with some friends after, but yeah, I thought. It, I thought the obstacles were were pretty fun. Tyler, from from seeing. From seeing Killian at that Warrior Dash to uh, to chatting with him right now, what does it uh, what does it feel like? We've got Robert Killian on right now. It's it sounds like Bracken, but if you look at the screen, it says it's Robert. Yeah, I never never thought I'd get to this level. You know, thought I'd just be some <laughs> random guy. I'd, I'd pass on a course, but yeah, no. never thought I'd get to this point. Speaking just just, man. just to clarify, people, um, for some reason. Tyler's PC hates him and Obstacle Dominator, so it won't let him use a video. Trust us, we tried for an extensive amount of time to get it to work. Instead, we're just going to have to settle with his his beautiful name on the screen. But we'll post a picture of him so you know what he looks like. But Tyler, um, who, why, why, I like making people do this, see how uh, confident and able to represent yourself you are. Why did Obstacle Dominator want to have you on? Uh, I've never been on before. I mean... This is this is new for me, and I figured maybe you want to see how I stack up against the other the other guys. In the way, <laughs> all right, I, I give you a, 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 C, a C for C. <laughs> for Korean, maybe. But for Tyler, I'll tell you why we wanted you on. It's twofold. First is the obvious one: you just had your your major like breakthrough moment. But second is because. In true obstacle dominator fashion, we like bringing in people who have unique backstories. And you have, I think I've said this before, but as unique a backstory as anyone will really ever have getting into the sport of OCR. And I think we, we should probably trace Tyler back to his roots as an athlete. You want to do that, Benny? We should, because this is part of the value that co-hosts bring to the table. Bracken knows Tyler, so he knows what questions to ask. I represent the ignorant guest that has no idea about Tyler's background. So Tyler, why don't you fill me in the guests in on what the heck Bracken's talking about? Um, yeah, I mean, I started, I have a stronger running background than anything. I, I did cross country and track in high school for four years and then uh, moved on to do collegiate 
uh, ran, I ran collegiately for one year. Um, I couldn't say I had any outstanding performances in college at that point, but um, you know, I, I mostly just wanted to try and stay in running shape for a little while, even though, you know, I, I kind of just stopped running for a sec, like after college, but then I, I got back into it. Um, but then I kind of picked back up some other, other stuff. Uh, I joined a collegiate circus for a little bit and, uh, and kind of, here got, we go. This, this that. right there, <laughs> we will never have another guest say I joined the circus. This is fantastic. Then. Do you have any clue I, what that was coming? No, I thought he said collegiate circuit, like some kind circus. of, okay. Circus. Well, I had you clarified that. Cause I was like, okay, so it's pretty standard so far, but what, what is that? What, what kind of circus? Um, so we weren't like a traveling one. We, you know, we performed at, at the school in our, my, our basketball arena. Um, but for about two years, I was a part of the, the Gamma Phi Circus. And it was, it's been around for, I want to say like 50, maybe around 50 years this time. It's been around for a while, but um, they have, they have all kinds of acts. They have uh, wall trampoline, tumbling, vaulting, um they have acro there's people like stacking each other like make like five five people high standing on their shoulders they you know they have tight wire like all kinds of stuff anything you can think of in a circus but um you know i just thought like what the hell like <laughs> i might as well give it a shot because uh coming into it before that um i actually i don't think anyone knows but i, I kind of got into like a little bit of break dancing like i might have might have dabbled with that for for a hot second can you do um, the windmill i actually i actually could do it for maybe like a couple of them or so dude how do um, you have a b-boy what are you a b-boy b-boy yeah. yeah um I, I never got like a, a name or anything but yeah how tall are you i'm like five five eight okay so you look acceptable doing the windmill i'm six foot three i look like a, a spiraling awkward death trap when i do the windmill <laughs> I mean, I've seen guys about your height do it, but yeah, it's, it takes dude, a little more. Effort. It's hard to make. It's hard to be boy and not look just weird when you're this tall. Yeah, yeah. So this is like the. Is this where are you from, Tyler? What's your state? Indiana, uh, right? Or are you Illinois? El Illinois. Illinois. Yeah. So being from Wisconsin, <laughs> right next door, I can say that like most Midwest families. Don't like lay out the path before you're like, you know, you're going to run for a little bit, track and cross country, then you're going to go off to college, you're going to do some break dancing, and then we're going to segue into the circus. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is not the typical Midwestern path. What was like the instigating factor that got you down that and then made you think like this, this is something cool to pursue? Yeah, you know, I mean, it was just the curiosity part. Like I... I didn't know what I could do, what I was capable of, but I, I just, I wanted to have fun and see, see what would happen, to be honest. Like I, I was pretty strong starting, starting out with it. Like, you know, I had, I, I would do a lot of calisthenics and stuff and, you know, it just started out with, with me doing like a little simple handstand and whatnot. But then I just started joining some friends and uh, we started going to some gyms together and just messing around. And I, it actually, I turned out to be pretty good, even though like I didn't really have a background and gymnastics or anything but like I don't know it was just uh the curiosity factor like I you know I, I knew I could be could be good at running but I just I really felt like I wanted to try something else something that I never envisioned myself doing and you know, I guess also being a part of something different um just these these groups of people that get together and do these things you know it felt felt pretty good to to be a part of that something special you know and what, what I guess role, that's what I was wanting what, what role did you play in the circus? Like, what were you, an acrobat? I had, I had a couple acts. Um, the ones that I did were my first one of wall trampoline. That was my, by far my favorite. Um, we would just put, a, like, a gymnastics, like, competitive trampoline right alongside a wall, and we'd be bouncing, like, off our backs and running up the wall and, like, doing flips off it. We'd be going tandem, three people, four people, like, all bouncing at once, and, like, it was crazy. Like That's awesome. I, I saw... <laughs> I saw so much stuff there, like the most insane stuff. And it was like, you know, I, I could not be a part of that. Like I knew I was capable. I knew I had the talent and I just wanted to keep going with it. Like, you know, I, I was thinking maybe I'd continue doing this through like Ninja Warrior, like eventually or like Cirque du Soleil, but like 
it was just fun. You know, it's something crazy. I never thought I'd get, get myself into, but like, yeah. So, um, I did wall trampoline and then, uh, tumbling and vaulting, which is just a bunch of, uh, tumbling acts, uh, flips and whatnot. And we'd set up a long, uh, trampoline where we perform acrobats. Um, we do these long tumbling passes you know, on, onto a mat and we'd kind of coordinate all of us would coordinate a big, uh, a big scene where we're all just doing flips and stuff all at once. Um, we'd also have little trampolines that uh, like vaulting, um, vaulting tramps. You hit it and then you can do a couple flips into it. Um, I think my signature one was I would run, do a flip and then rotate halfway in the air and then come out of a back foot. Um, That's called a brandy I, back just for the, for the viewers out there. It, that is a yeah. brandy back. I, I called it half in half out, but we can that call it that too. too. Back in, do you know that because of uh, nah, not 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 the sister I met, the other one, the gymnast? Well, I was a gymnast for thirteen years. Oh, I forget about oh. that. You, you and Macaulay both did gymnast. No way. Yeah. yeah Man, Tyler, we bond over this. <laughs> that that was my first when I going from level uh, five to level four in gymnastics. As a man, you count down from ten to one. Women count from one up to ten. But so when you go from five to four, you change from compulsory to optional. Compulsory are where they set out the routines for you. Optional is where you can create your own moves into certain routines. And then level four, that was my vault, was the, the brandy back, half, half flip, uh, or flip, half turn, back, land, facing, opposite of where you started. Yes. So I, I have a soft spot in my heart for that, for that move. <laughs> That's a good one. Look at this. Hi, Ayla. Mira, Mira. Can oh, you... I couldn't see. I know, I know your kids. Hi, Mira. Say hi. Oh, she can't hear, huh? Yeah. You're in the headphones. <laughs> hi, Mira. Hi, Mira. <laughs> Mira, look, I'm missing a tooth. What happened there? Well, now you're just scaring uh, the kids. I'm going to mute and say good night. You guys carry on. All right. Um, uh, Mexico happened. I went to Mexico and got like $55,000 worth of dental work done. And uh, that one needed to come out. The canine is supposed to go back in place and fill in that gap. There was a tooth that was like pushing the canine out of the way. So they just took it out and canine's going to go back in. Oh. Yeah. So right, we're with, back. Yeah. So with your uh, with your gymnastics background, or uh, sorry, not gymnastics background, keep, keep going with the circus because it's like, why are you not in in Cirque du Soleil right now? Like, yeah. where'd you train? Um, yeah, you know that's a, that's a good question. I mean, I could have I could have kept going with it. Um, I I had opportunities to to do that actually because I had the uh, like executive or the um, vice president, whatever of the circus. He contacted me asking if I was interested in. Dude. Joining like another, but it was like a whole nother show, like out of state, like on the Eastern side. And I was just like, like, Oh, like I really wanted to, but I was in Colorado just kind of doing my thing. And like, that's when I, when I came out here, like that's when I actually started training and like getting into it. And then I was thinking like, okay, you know, maybe I'll, this is my, my primary focus right now. And you know, the circus thing I could, I could maybe find time to like go and just like mess around. Like, wait, so, so, and, while you're doing all, all these circus performances, what some friend just shows you a Spartan race and you go do one, and then that kind of just became more important. Uh, well, yeah, like as I was, so I got I got pretty strong. We were doing a lot of gymnastics uh, uh, workouts and all that stuff, and I I was thinking like, man, I, I kind of need to get back in a running shape a little bit. And you know, at the time I was kind of getting a Ninja Warrior too, so I was thinking, okay, like let's. I want to run, but I, I need, I need to do something else with myself. Like I need, I need a little extra challenge here. Um, so I just kind of started researching, like, I know well, I heard about the warrior dash and Spartan and all that um, kind of at that time when I was, when I was in the circus, cause my friends were, a lot of them were in Ninja Warriors <laughs> obstacle racing. So um, I heard about that and um, I just decided to sign up for some like really really local race like Hard charge. like no no no, not even that one it was uh it was like be beast mode challenge it was like the most uh ridiculous it was the most ridiculous race i've done like they one of the obstacles or you could call it an obstacle where you would literally like run across field and there would be paint paintballing at you like not not a lot but, like, 
like just a little but like <laughs> that was the weirdest <laughs> it was actually pretty fun but i had no idea like what was going on dude yeah. i want to do a collection of everybody's small small local race experiences because <laughs> they 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 do whatever they want because <laughs> they don't have to fall <laughs> to the masses i think the second race i ever did i did a spartan race that was my introduction and then i immediately started researching and there was this one called the caveman crawl dual sport which to this day is one of my favorite races i've ever done i don't think it's still around anymore but it was you do a 5k obstacle course with the most dangerous terrain you've ever seen like there was probably a nine foot cliff that you had to jump off of that was just part of the trail and there's no way to like slide down it it was literally the you know course was marked really well and then it just like someone cut it with a knife, just like a nine foot drop. <laughs> and I'm jumping thinking this is insane. I'm having fun, but I'm thinking about short people. And then you, uh, you end the 5k obstacle course, you jump on a bike, the trends, there's no order to anything. There's just bikes everywhere. And I just get on a bike and it's an 11 mile mountain bike course. And I was thinking, you know what, they let anybody sign up for this. It's probably just going to be really easy. It was the craziest, like I've done mountain biking on all parts of this country and it was the most dangerous mountain biking I've ever done. Um, and they put, uh, it, well, hold on, we'll get back to you in a second, Tyler. This is a really funny story. Yeah. Just, I'm so much in a fight for first and second here for first, second is right behind me and the finish line's maybe 20 yards ahead. I, I had like tunnel vision and I wasn't really aware because I was like kind of my first second athletic experience and uh, racing experience. And there's all I see is what I think is like a huge mountain of like crushed ice, like soft crushed ice, like you would make with like snow cones out of. And so in my head, I'm thinking, yeah, you're supposed to jump across the finish line into this ice. And it turns out it's, it's just like an eight foot cloud of soap bubbles. And so I leap as tall, as high as I can spin around in the air. So I'm going to land on my back and I just whack oh that probably did not sound so great on audio but i just whack into the ground and i had my eyes open and saw my victorious finish line photos and celebration are just me for like 15 minutes with like soap in my eyes and 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 crying and now when crushed my... ice it felt any better to well, back i don't know video? i don't know there wasn't much thinking going on but in my mind yeah i was picturing like I don't know. Soft, soft pillowy landing on ice. I don't know. It was like the kind of like snow cone type ice that would squish. I don't know. Okay. Um, yeah. Anyways, back 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 to your 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 tiny event. Uh yeah, I mean I don't remember much, but they have they had some heavy carries and it was super short. But um, that the paintball that was that was the one that was like most out there. Can you imagine if Spartan there. had a race this year and decided to shoot people with paintballs? <laughs> <laughs> what would have happened? <laughs> Are they got people with pugil sticks, but instead of whacking you with them, they just spear throw them at you as you run by? I mean, that's the stuff that can't happen in a big race, but local races just get away with. I love it. So Tyler, yeah. right around this time is when I met you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, saw you at a hard charge and then met you at the Indiana Sprint. Wait, did you, did, I don't think, did we race together a hard charge? Cause we I didn't race the same one, but I watched your show in preparation for my show. That's and right. They did yeah. like a little, little special on you and they showed you on the course and Macaulay and I both watched it. And then we saw you at the Indiana sprint, not too long after, but we both had the same takeaway watching you. We're like, there's this just freak athlete out here on the course, just like bounding <laughs> over things and hurtling and doing all these crazy explosive, not even anywhere close to efficient moves. And then we saw you run and, and race in Indiana and race against you. And I don't know if you remember that race too much, but we came out of this, one of the world's worst muddy barbed wire crawls. You remember that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's like swimming through mud <laughs> and you were right on us. You were just doggedly refusing to back away. And we were fit at the time and like kind of a big deal in the sport in that day and age. And you were just someone that most people never seen before, but you were just like happily hammering yourself into the ground. And afterwards we both talked like this kid is a freak athlete who does not yet understand what he's doing or how good he could be. And so it was really cool to see you come back to the sport, you know, fit and able to make your progression up the way you have. Yeah. You know, I, I thought that was the beauty of it. Like I didn't know what the heck I was doing, what I was getting myself into. I was just kind of like literally throwing myself out there <laughs> and just kind of seeing what would happen. But um, I, I just liked that, you know, I, I, I liked that 
that factor of the unknown, not knowing what to expect and just kind of going with it. And uh, yeah, I might've been a little reckless on that, uh, that hard charge course, but like, that's, that's the way I wanted to like play it out. You know, I just wanted to like intimidate this guy. And I think it might've worked a little bit. But yeah. Well, was... <laughs> not making this about me at all, but I feel like I've raced almost everyone who's ever been a somebody in this sport regardless of how I've done against them, I've raced just about everyone there is to race. And the, the vast majority of people, you get to kind of know their, you get a feel for their personality by the end of a race. And you are in a small percent of people who you can feel like a real, like exuberant personality out on the course. I would add you in with like uh, Kempson's, Ian Hosick, um, Josh Swanser, Hunter, um, and, and maybe that's it. Maybe Rose Wetzel, but uh, people who are out there truly just having a blast and throwing themselves into it because they want to find out and they're having a blast finding out. And it's cool to kind of hear that you got into B-Boy because of that. You got into the circus because of that. And that has carried through into OCR. And I believe that once you get to the top of a sport, your physical characteristics are half of what determine your ceiling but the other half is how close can you get to your ceiling is your mental makeup and i think that your mental makeup the, the fact that you truly enjoy getting out there and seeing what you can do rather than seeing if you can't fail you know that, that kind of distinction there i think that is incredibly key to what you've done and what you're about to do yeah i agree Bracken, what do you think he's about to do? What, what, what are your plans, Tyler? I mean, well, first of all, back up. Why do you think that, Bracken? Is it because of this Utah race? Oh, I think he's seen signs the whole time. I mean, like, like he talked about, he's just throwing himself around the course early on. And now he pairs that, you know, very unique and high-level athleticism with the efficiency and the obstacle know-how to use it only when needed. You know, like you watch him do a monkey bars. Go back and watch the Utah race. It was a great... Uh, indication of it and also the uh, the big bear race when they get to the monkey bars Tyler you were with a group on both of those correct going into those monkey bars oh yeah 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 and and some people were switching and swinging some people were trying to do the 90 degree match 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 and Tyler was just going forward for most of it but the, the way he pulls back on the bar and propels forward was just different than everyone around him and he did it faster and in both of those he probably had the fastest monkey bar split of the elite group who went through that. He was with the, the top pack of the elite field and he was just faster than them. And he didn't put more energy into it. He just paired his natural ability with some of his you know circus learned movement with now obstacle efficiency. And now he's also backing it up with high level climbing and descending. And we saw glimpses in Tahoe last year. What were you, eighth or ninth at the spear throw before you missed? Uh, yeah, I threw right with uh, Kent at that point. Yeah. And, and then Big Bear, you know, leading the race in the Sand Bay carry. And then um, Utah taking third at the final stop, the most important stop of the U.S. National Series and doing it convincingly. Like these, anyone can pop one race. Now, how high you pop is dependent on how good you are, but people can have a race. But to have continual, you know, radar points on the map, that is a mark of consistency and consistency means you belong there and that you're capable of popping higher. And so just looking at your races objectively from the outside, it shows like this guy is legit and he has not hit his ceiling yet. So I'm excited to see West Virginia, but I'm even more excited to see Tahoe because it's the course, you know, that course is similar terrain to where you live and train and it's altitude, like what you are used to. And last year you were top 10 halfway through the race it just, it's the kind of thing that I expect that you're going to continue to show us things like you showed us in Utah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I actually hadn't planned on West Virginia yet, uh, but I'm extremely tempted to go. Well, don't, don't you know, right. I'm going to go out there. So you might as well sit it out. No. <laughs> All right. I'll take one for the team. Thank you. Tyler, where, where in Colorado are you at now? Um, right, like in Morrison, which is like right near Golden, a little bit. It's like sitting in the foothills, still Denver area. Okay. But uh, kind of right, right near uh, Red Rocks Amphitheater, which is pretty popular, like musical yeah. 
performance. I'll bet, that's new for you this year, correct? You were higher up the last few years? Yes, yes. I was I was living out in the mountains, uh, yeah, the last like three years or so. This is good. I want to talk about this because a lot of people crave high altitude and they think that the higher altitude, the better. I want to hear if you have found that to be true or if you found a little bit more freedom in your training now living a bit lower, if you have access to a, a different amount of speeds that you can train at. Um, I, I, I find it better, uh, a little more enjoyable being out in the front range, like not so much in the mountains. Like I can still drive out maybe 30 minutes and I'll be at uh, uh, 9,000 feet or so. Um, I, I think it's still just as convenient. You know, I can, I can literally walk out my front door right now and get like 1300 feet per like, like a few miles. Like it's, it's still so convenient for me. And, um, there's so much variety in trails, you know, like I still, I found a lot of stuff out, out there, um, where I was living in the mountains, but it seems like there's a lot of, a lot of variety out here too. Um, just with the, the technicality of the trails and, and whatnot. Um, but yeah, it seems like I'm running more than I have been since living out here, which is kind of weird, but I don't know, maybe I was getting burnt out a little too easily when I was out in the mountains, maybe because I was, I was pushing myself a little harder, you know, just kind of living at like 9,000 feet or 10,000, even uh, when I was living at like Estes Park, I was, we were, we were up there. Um, well, it's certainly harder to sleep and recover at that height. Yeah. Have you found that you're able to run better and more frequent speed workouts at a lower altitude? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. You know, my, my heart rate might not skyrocket as fast, um, compared to when I'm at altitude. It's like, I mean, even with a solid warm up in, it still feels like I am working myself like early on and out here. It's like, I, I don't, I feel like I don't need as much, as much time. I feel, I feel pretty good. Like, you know, it's, it felt come to think of it it felt like a little unnatural when i was running my really hard workouts out in the mountains like i was getting exhausted like just completely spent from some of that stuff like when i was on leaderboard doing some of those workouts i was like oh my gosh that like and maybe because i wasn't as consistent in my training as i am now but um yeah i was i was getting worked out there well, I think that consistency plays into the altitude. It's just so much harder to remain consistent with what is uh, the ideal training program for what you're trying to achieve. I had I I'd bounce back kind of the same the same results for my tampering with altitude. Uh, obviously, there's the scientific percentage increase on performance you get when you go down to sea level to compete from altitude. But honestly, with the majority of time that I spend is spent training at altitude and then trying to recover at altitude. It's like, uh, what about the psychological and, and like chronic fatigue that you, that you deal with if you don't adjust your training? And then if you adjust your training, you're getting the altitude benefit, but you may not be doing as much volume or the right kind of volume that you could be doing at sea level. And I, I, there's, just, there's one big main benefit for altitude, and there's a, a lot. It's like a dance you have to do to make sure that you – don't have a ton of cons so it's it's almost like unless you're willing to really learn and get really good at dodging all the cons of living at altitude true altitude like 9000 like what you're talking about to me it's not really worth it i mean i never i wasn't tracking anything extremely closely but i never felt or noticed the difference when i would go compete at sea level uh from altitude i i don't know but it's been my experience yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, I think it was the recovery part for me. I was, I just wasn't giving myself enough time or something because I was, I was just working myself so hard at that, that level, you know, that altitude, but yeah, it's, and I, I think it is consistency pretty much. I've been, I've been pretty dang consistent training out, out here. So, so what's your, What's, what's your high level kind of overview goals for obstacle course racing? Obviously you are, uh, you know, laying your stamp down on the U.S. Spartan National Series. You're probably going to Tahoe. Is that just your general aim moving forward is continue dominating or, you know, you know, attempting to dominate the, the Spartan National Series with an end cap of, of Tahoe every year? Or do you have some other things like maybe OCR Worlds or something? Um, I mean, honestly, right now, nothing, nothing beyond Spartan Worlds. Like, I, I'm, I'm really getting familiar with, uh, with Spartan and, um, 
I think I, I have, you know, I got a knack for it so, and I want to, I want to keep, keep getting better, keep building on, on what I have. And, um, you know, maybe OCR worlds, I can see myself going to in the future. Um, but for now, I kind of just want to stick to the the series that I've been doing and um, the obstacles I'm, I'm getting a little familiar with, but no, I think OCR worlds would be, um, would be a good goal for myself. Like I'm not familiar with, yeah. I, and I've seen like pictures and videos of some of the rigs that they have. And now those look extremely exciting. Like I would absolutely love that out there. You know, I, I think it'd be fun coming up to an obstacle and not really knowing exactly what to do, but like figuring out the time, like to do it. And you know, it's kind of, I think that's pretty cool. Not really knowing. Well, even if, even if you go in, you know, it's kind of going back to, yeah, even, even if you know what you're supposed to do, you still come into those with a doubt as to whether you can do them or not. I mean, Ryan Atkins, who's got arguably, at least provenly, the, the greatest grip strength out of anybody in our sport, grip strength endurance, uh, I saw him come up to one of the rigs that was, uh, you know, fresh, really not that difficult, but I've never seen him stand before an obstacle except maybe once or twice in a battle frog years ago and shake his hands out and just look unconfident about, and this was only maybe a third of the way into the 15 K and he was shaking his hands out and I was like, Holy freaking crap. So they're, they're, they're tricky and they're difficult. So you definitely don't want to go into a race like that without studying them first. But yeah, with your, when you're ninja gymnastics circus background, I was thinking, I was trying to picture what, when Bracken was describing how you just throw yourself through a course, what that would look like and the kind of movements and creative approaches to each one of these obstacles you would come up with. Because each one of these obstacles are so new to the majority of the competitors that every year there's like four or five new crazy looking techniques that are invented for every obstacle. And I think you'd be one of those innovators. Yeah, yeah. You know, I. I think one of my strengths is is being able to adapt. I mean, to especially to some obstacles that are new to me. I mean, like just recently, or not too recently, really. I went to some guy's uh, Ninja Warrior gym, and it was intense. Like it was it was hardcore. I mean, they had pretty much a whole replica of like some of the hardest obstacles there, and I was just kind of going for it. And you know, I, I figured it out eventually, at, with like a little bit of trial and error. But like, you know, I think I, I have. My, one of my strengths is just adapting a little quicker than most. Like I, I feel like I have pretty good body awareness, you know, and I think I got that from the circus and um, just kind of figuring out where I need to be like in the air. Like I think, I think that can translate a little bit to, to some of the obstacles that I, that I go through in my races. But Tyler, do you, do you have anything different that you do in your training or your recovery or your warm up or your cool down or your race mentality. I don't know you as an athlete or as a person, do you have anything different that you've seen that might not be something that the majority of the field is doing that maybe gives you an edge or, or helps you come into a race with a good mentality? Um, I mean, not necessarily. I don't, I don't think I'm doing anything too crazy for, for like I'm working full time at the home Depot. That's like, that's, that's like, my strength work right there, like most of it, to be honest. I mean, that's, it's probably not too, too different, but, um, you know, once in a while I practice my carries, but honestly, just I'm out in the mountains, like almost 24 seven. And like, that's kind of what's, what's doing it for me. Like, so you're, you're floating off residual strength that you've had and maintaining the strength you've had from, all your calisthenic movements and, and, uh, kind of circus background. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I like to just stay on top of it. And yeah, I haven't, I haven't done anything too different in my training, man. That, um, yeah, but. <laughs> that seems to be something you can get away with in, in Spartan racing. And, uh, maybe now that warrior dash is gone, tough Mudder has removed their competitive events. Um, OCR World Championships isn't really competition. It's not a series. You know, they're, they're the last big name in obstacle course racing that's competitive. Maybe now that the ball is entirely in their courts and they don't have to deal with other races, uh, they might start uh, adding some things in and playing with some new formulas. Uh, maybe making it so that, I mean, in my mind, you look at the training of some of the competitive athletes and or the majority of them, 
and it can help to determine what you want to tweak in a race to to challenge your athletes more because like you just said you don't really have to do strength to be great at spartan like even the strength aspects like carrying a bucket or a sandbag it's still not really about your strength it's, it's about your cardiovascular engine uh maybe at the beast level where they they take the obstacle difficulty up it starts to get down to your grip strength endurance but it's still really not something you need to work on that much once you hit a certain point so i don't know would you like to see them uh add in uh, to be a little bit more of a balance or are you enjoying and and just happy and content with them keeping the current ratio of you know, just predominantly, it needs to be about you know specifically mountain running, but then secondary, your running ability. Um, I mean, honestly, like even though it was harder, a little more grueling, I I did miss like the longer carries that they that they had, like the double double sandbag and everyone, and all that. Like I I knew people dreaded it, like you know I kind of dreaded it as well, but I just I liked that that thought of like like am I really gonna finish this like. Uh -huh. I'd be able to make this through. I, th I think so. Like maybe, yeah. like that. That kind of builds character. I, I like. I I feel good coming out of something like that, knowing, you know, knowing I can do it. Like that's that's what made Spartan kind of special for me in the beginning is just all these different tasks of carrying heavy stuff and you know, rough to the mud and all that stuff. Like I I like that. You know, I kind of miss that. That's what you know. That's what made it special for me. Yeah, yeah there I'm, hasn't yeah. been a course I'll in take, a while where we've had to question, are we going to make it? And that, I think everyone's first few Spartan races, you have that go through your head, like, am I going to be able to get through this carry? Or can I get to the top of this climb? And half of that is that we've all just gotten so much better at doing what it is we're about to do in the course. You know, we train it better. But part of it is that they have gone a little bit more towards standardization. And it would be kind of cool to see some races where you get to question things again. Yeah, I agree. I mean, my, my first year at Worlds wasn't the greatest, but it, it was quite an eye-opening experience, I could tell you that. But it was, uh, you know, I went through some stuff that was pretty dang hard. And But I'm, I'm glad that that happened, you know. I learned from it, and, you know, I wanted them to keep doing it so I could I could better myself and prepare for it, you know. Everything that Spartan is doing now, I am I'm definitely a fan of. I love where they're taking the company and the racing and everything. But uh, that's awesome that you're able to isolate the specific thing that I think so many people love and have experience. It's like when Bracken explained to me the place you go mentally during the mile, like when you're going for a mile PR, and then I experienced it. It was cool to see him describe that experience very clearly. You just isolated an aspect that uh, immediately made me smile because I haven't, <laughs> like what Bracken said, I haven't felt that in so long where I come up to something in a race and I'm like, shit, I actually don't know if I'll be able to do this. And it's such a slap in the face reminder of the stuff you experienced when you got into obstacle racing. Like, am I going to get shot in the head with a paintball as I run through here? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, Tyler, a, a little bit earlier, you, you touched upon something that I did want to hear a bit more about. You said that moving down from altitude, your overall running has gone up higher. Now, I, I was a little curious about what sort of volume, what sort of training you were doing prior when you're living at 9,000 feet and such, and what you're hitting now. Um, when you're, you're not in flatland, but now that you're down or more around that 5,000 foot range and, uh, what, what has your training done? Has it really progressed? What are you doing now versus then? And what else have you done? You know, changing anything up wise to move from fringe, you know, challenger to a legitimate podium threat every race. Um, yeah, you know, when I was living out in the mountains, um, I think I just, I wasn't giving myself enough rest. Like I, I was just kind of putting myself out there and, and pushing myself maybe harder than I should not. I mean, I'd have easy days. I'd have hard days, but I think on the easier days, um, I kind of got <laughs> pretty much like caught up in the, in the beauty of everything. I'd just always be going for trail runs up mountains and just exploring new places. And I kind of got caught up in all that. Never, never really gave myself like proper, proper rest. I think that's kind of, what uh, set me back a little bit when I was living out in the mountains and also a combination of not training as consistently. But, um, you know, I think it, it did pay off when I, when I was racing like Breckenridge or whatever for the first time, like I did feel pretty good at that, at that altitude for sure. 
um, I kind of noticed the difference there. And you had a great race there. You pushed Killian there, right? Uh, I, I was, I made the podium at, with, uh, on, with Onhill and Killian. And those two were, were duking it out like a little bit ahead of me. But that was the first time I made the podium was out, out there at that race. And it was like, still on like that, that race. You're on the sandbag here at the same time of them late in the race, right? Um, I believe so. Yeah, it's kind of hard to remember, but um, yeah, and I remember Austin Azar was was behind me too. I didn't know who he was, but um, yeah, this was like after the one of the big uh, national races that they had out there. Um, but yeah, you know, I I don't think I was giving myself like proper rest in my training when I was when I was out there, and my my schedule was just kind of like my work schedule was a little funky, so just kind of training around those times. Like I'd be training late, really late in the day, one day, and then really early in the morning, the next. And it was just like, I was just kind of all over the place. And I guess that didn't really like motivate me enough to, to train more consistently and, um, and whatnot. And I wasn't really using like heart rate training or anything to like monitor or log my, my training runs. Like I actually never really logged my, my training runs. Um, <laughs> which I, when I think about it, it's like, every day and it really helps motivate me like that's something i never did especially in high school like i would never do that i didn't see the need to really but uh yeah um so how has your volume changed between then and now um you know i i think i'm i'm at like a decent vo amount of volume nothing nothing too crazy i'm hitting around 30 a week but i'm just trying to get more vert uh vert in than anything you know i'm i'm pretty much just going off off my time um earlier it was like strictly mileage like I, I go out for a five mile run 10 mile run whatever but now it's just like i'm just kind of going off time and uh you know it, lately it's been adding up to like maybe four and a half hours or five hours a week that kind of thing like nothing absurd and you know because i'm with that um I would get up to, I, I've gotten up to like a little over 11,000 one week and with like 30, 30 miles. Um, Cause usually my longer runs would be above like maybe 2,500, 3,000 feet or more. Um, so I'd get a lot there. But like I said, you know, I can run right out my front door and get plenty of vertical. Like, and so I, I do that every day and I don't really see the need for me to get like a whole lot of volume in. Uh, maybe, for these upcoming months, I'm, I will be upping it the volume a little bit, but um, it's mostly just just vertical that I'm getting that kind of dictates my my intensity and, and all that. But I, I've been training consistently, and it's it's been about you know average thirty maybe thirty five miles a week or so. And I wasn't getting that like when I was living out in the mountains, it wasn't as consistent. I was just kind of all over the place. I, that's interesting because that's that's very low compared to the people that you're beating right now. And, and what I think that speaks to is how much higher your ceiling still sits ahead of you. You know, you're yeah, getting a yeah. good payback off 30 to 35 miles a week with, you know, 11 and 12 K of vert. And, and that means that you have a long time ahead of you where you can keep progressing. And that speaks to some future dominance as well in the sport. Again, another factor on your, you know, your map, that's another indicator that says this isn't a fluke so far. Yeah. Um, and I'm working like 40, 45 hours a week. So like I'm, and for my job, I'm constantly moving. Like that's, so like, I don't, the key for me is, is to balance my, that and training, like, and it's been working for me. I've, I've been, I, I feel great. Like, I don't think right now I need to do anything too crazy with my volume, but you know, I, I just want to balance the two. And I think where I'm at now is, is pretty good. Um, but like I am, I am constantly moving, like on the go at my other job. And I feel like if I'm, if I'm trying, you know, if I up the volume anymore, um, I might get a little burned out at work. But so now, my feet's a real thing. That that does that does play into your overall stress. So that's, that's yeah, a benefit yeah. you have going. I, my last I try question about your that. training. Then my last question is that. Uh, are you, how is your, your 30 to 35 divided? Are you pretty even across the board or are you putting the vast chunks of that mileage into some bigger workouts? Um, I'd say I'm, I am across the board. I mean, I'll have my, like, you know, one, one long, long day of the week, but for the most part, it'll be, 
pretty evened out. Um, you know, I'll have my easier days, just like, I don't know, 30, 30 minute run or so, um, mixed in also with my, when I'm doing it, my job, uh, cause I kind of count that in training, but yeah, it's pretty, pretty spread out evenly for the most part, like nothing too sporadic. Okay. Okay. So with, with your, uh, one of the main questions I get uh, is about uh, anytime somebody reaches out to ask for help on how to structure their week or training questions. And I tell people, uh, what I would suggest they almost always come back with their work schedule and how, you know, if I have any ideas of how they can work it in around their schedule. And that's always something I'm like, you gotta, I, you gotta figure it out because I've structured my life in a way to where my work is it's contract work. It's all over the place. And it's, that is sporadic, but it's still within my choice of what time frame I participate in that. And I did that because I identified that, I mean, I, push hasn't come to shove, so maybe I could do this, but I've decided I'm not the type of person who if I'm working a nine to five, I got to be up at seven in the morning and not back till six, then there's no way in hell I'm actually also adding in a workout before and after that. So with you working 40 to 45 hours a week and that being a physical job, uh, how are you, do you have any tips or, well, first tell us what you're doing. Are you training before work and then after work? Are you mostly just training after work? Um, and then what are some tips, I guess, for people who have jobs like that, which is the majority of people, how you still get in your work and how you make sure it's consistent and not just like, uh, you know, you did really good for three days in a row and then you're just super tired because of it. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my hours actually fluctuated like a lot before, before this, like I was, I was working in the mornings, I was working later in the days. Um, so I'd be, I'd have to adapt to it and train like either, you know, early morning, midday, um, or kind of later in the evening. Um, but, but now actually I got my schedule changed to where I will be kind of training mid midday. Nice. Um, but you know, I, I, if I have, if I know that the next day, like it can work, it's going to be hell and uh, I'll be busy, then I'll take it easy the day before. So I'm, so I'm feeling fresh. I'll feel good. Um, because I need that balance. Like I, I just, I cannot show up to work feeling like crap. Like that's just not, cause then I just can't do my job. But, um, earlier I was just all over the place. I was training at all times during the day, which was kind of stressful. Um, but I communicated that with them. And so now I will actually be working like a solid, like, actually early shift like five to one so i'll be getting off midday working working until like one or so and then so, working I, so it's more about uh attempting to adjust your surroundings and your circumstances to fit your 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 goals uh rather than trying to just push through all of the time just like oh yeah yeah oh yeah i i don't let i don't let that you know work's important but like this is like almost equally, if not more important to me. And if I can find a way to balance it out better um, to where, you know, maybe even benefits my training or whatever, like I'll, I'll find that way. And, you know, I don't, I don't let it, I don't let one interfere with the other. Like that's, that's just the biggest thing is I gotta, I gotta keep the stresses low in my life by, by keeping that balance. Like that is the most important, like, you know, I know I'm young and I can, I could probably handle all that stress but it's like no like right now at this time like it is so important for me like to recover when i need to and to have those hard days when i need to and feel good like you know i got i try to plan ahead and set myself up for that so that that happens so, so with your recovery do you have anything in particular you do is it more just not training um yeah well actually i used to just like not do anything like i'll just just take a complete day off like you know, and, and I'm starting to realize that doesn't really work for me. Um, I'll, I'll do anything from like now just from going on a easy hike, um, maybe just in my backyard to um, going to the climbing gym, that kind of thing, um, or just a, a nice easy bike ride, just kind of anything like that. Like I, I have to stay active unless there's a day where I just feel like garbage, then I, I'm usually, I'm pretty smart about that. I don't, I don't go out and do anything because I, I know myself better than, than anyone. Like I, there's definitely days where I'm just like mentally 
exhausted and I never, you know, go out and try to push through that. Like to me, that's, that's the worst thing you could do to yourself. Like, you know, I, I know what I can handle, what I can't handle. And I like to, to read, read myself, you know, and it's, yeah, it's, it's important. Keep it's that a great reminder that consistency is king and that hitting home run workouts here and there just never ever pays off long term over chipping away day after day and always getting the work in that should be done. It's a great reminder because there's so many people working and training out there, or even people who aren't working are just training that hero workouts never ever play out long term. It's always consistency. I like hearing that. Yeah. And you know, I, I still feel like I'm I'm new to the like teaching, like training myself. And I'm, I'm learning so much and, and, you know, I just want to play it smart. You know, I've, I've been doing good and I just want to keep it on a roll and, um, just keep those stresses low in my life and not let anything, uh, take my focus off, uh, my, you know, the main goal, making it to, to worlds and, and doing well. There. Yeah. It sounds like, uh, there, there's a book called the slight edge by Jeff Olson and, uh, it, it talks about what you guys are talking about now where it's um, kind of the general ideas is, is people underestimate what they can, they, they overestimate what they can do in one to three months and they underestimate what they can do in, I think it's like four months to eight months. And the, the idea is that it's a lot easier for people to wrap their minds around like these big one-off or maybe like hardcore efforts for like a week at a time or a month. Like anybody can try anything for a month. But that is why you don't have anybody like just anybody at the top. It's because it's not about the people who can go out and just, you know, work so freaking hard and put in like you can't measure effort, you know, blah, 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 the, the push through the pain. OK, but that's not that's not what pays the big dividends. It's the hard thing, which is consistency. I mean, I'm finding that with every aspect of life. If you do some big grand gesture you might get lucky and some, you might have some cool payoff from it. But for the majority of the time, the greatness comes from just these, the boring crap that nobody posts about online because it's not fun to look at or talk about. It's just, just all these, like you said, just like exploring and running around all the time and being on your feet. Like that doesn't sound like fun. You know, you didn't just tell us some sexy, actually, I'm going to ask you what your workout of the day is. Uh, and it's funny because we'll talk about this and then we'll get to workout of the day or workout of the week. And will always get the most interesting workout. And it's like, well, that's, that's part of the problem because all podcasts or interviews ever talk about it was like these, the hero workouts, the fun workouts, but it's like, it's not really where the dividends are. So what is your workout of the week, Tyler? Uh, well, you know, I came out to Colorado to explore new places. And so I, I freaking love going out for a super long run up the biggest mountain, biggest, steepest, scariest looking mountain whenever I can. And, and go explore it, run as far as I want. You know, I just, I love putting myself way out there and just in nature, you know? Yeah. <laughs> just, What's the longest long run you've done out there in training? Oh, let's see. I mean, you didn't it might not be the other day, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that was the longest this season. Um, Wait, did you say Pike's Peak? Pike's Peak. Yeah. With Killian and Rhea. Oh, so you, what, was that before or after that uh, bar camp race? Uh, that was after or bef before. Yeah, sorry. It was before. The, that bar one camp rec was just recently. Sweet. Yeah, yeah, it was it was way before that. Okay. Did you yeah. see how that did? Why didn't you? Uh, why didn't you do that bar camp race? Uh, actually, I didn't like know the date for that. Like, I knew it was happening. I just didn't know when it was. Uh, okay. I probably would have. <laughs> did you know that Johnny Luna Lima just set the all-time descent record even above Joe Gray from bar camp down? No way. Not yeah. Just that. He beat no Joe way. Gray on the down descent <laughs> by like two and a half minutes, like 220. Oh, my gosh. He beat I didn't... Killian on the descent by over five minutes. Man. Oh, my God. And the scary, man. Now his downhills are scary. It's scary to beat Killian by five. It's scarier to beat Joe by over two minutes. The scariest part is that he beat Killian to bar camp first. So not only is he way faster downhill, he's now also going to get to the top of Tahoe faster than a lot of good people. That's Man. crazy. What do you think? Uh, do you, is he now, I mean, I don't know how to say it officially, but is he now 
uh, almost without question the best downhiller in the sport? It seems that way. I mean, he's he's making a making an impact and showing everyone how much it, it can pay off, like how much time you can actually, you know, make up on that, that part. Uh, and it seems like he's it, always been so good downhills, but it was always lost because the rest of his race wasn't anything special. You know, in Tahoe each year, he was, I think Killian talked about it, 20 some minutes and 40 some minutes behind him his first two years, um, even though his downhills were faster. Because his climbing and flats just weren't anywhere near. And now the most incredible thing is that he's made up those two areas and now can still access the downhills. Right. And that's scary. Yeah. You know, so are you doing anything in your training to counteract someone's outlier talent like that? Are you putting a bigger emphasis on downhills? Um, yeah. I mean, I, I've been uh, slowly testing the waters with that a little bit. You know, I, I would treat the downhills as a pretty easy recovery on some of my harder workouts or longer, longer runs. But now I'm kind of playing around with it and um, practicing quicker feet over some little bit more technical stuff. And especially when the, uh, when the trails get smooth and pretty fast, I will start opening up a little bit and practicing like building my, my downhill muscles. Um, because I, you know, I think that's what's all, that's what paid off, you know, Utah is, uh, I wasn't really afraid to, to attack the downhills as, as much, you know, I, earlier, I just didn't have much experience bombing the downhills. Just like, I mean, it's a matter of like guts at some point, you know, it's <laughs> like, that's what it feels like, you know, I mean, it, it's, it can be hard on the legs for sure. But like, there's also that factor of like, like, do you have the guts to, to go through this? Like, dude, it's, down? <laughs> it's 100%. Uh, that is a huge part of it. I remember Canada, the first year we were at Blue Mountain, it was the 3K course. Um, we, oh, no, sorry. We were doing the team format. And we had a last-minute change, and I got shoved to the runner's role. And for anybody who did that, uh, the, the running section, it just starts straight up hill for I don't know how long. And by the time we got to the top of the hill, I there was maybe two people behind me. Like, it was not good. <laughs> and But by the time we got to the bottom, it's it, so it was raining. And uh, Bracken, you, you you did the obstacle section of the team. I huh? did the carries. I did strength that year. Okay, that's right. That's right. You little split shorts. Uh, no way. I was in. I was in compression. Oh, was it Gwiski who was in split shorts? Yeah. Okay, that's what I remember. Um, but uh, it was a wildly dangerous descent, and it was this. It was like they they said, "Forget a trail. We're just gonna follow this winding river that is shooting down uh, the side of this hill." And uh, it was rock. So it was like there was a little bit of mud because it's raining. There's a little bit, maybe a foot and a half on each side of this river that is just uh, it's just rocks. And it turned into this. Uh, I was like, look, I'm in like second to last here. I either need to go crazy and just get over my short gripping and, and potential damage and injury and just go for it. And when I got to the bottom, I think there were only, was it like, uh, I don't know, 11 or 13 people in front of me at that point? It, the amount of people I passed was unbelievable. And I somehow got down without injury, but it was 100% about guts because those guys all just showed that they had much superior leg strength than me getting to the top. And uh, that's routinely happened where I, I've been able to pass people who then immediately pass me again because they're much better athletes. Uh, but yeah, it, that's a huge section of it. But I want to, I think a part of the, the confidence that you need to have going into descending like that, no matter what terrain you're on, is your race kit and your shoe. So uh, just a real quick, what's a, what's a top to bottom portrait of you when you're racing? Are you you're racing with a shirt? You got a uh, um, water pack on? What kind of shoes are you wearing? Uh, well, I've been experimenting a little bit. You know, I, I usually wear compression shorts. Um, other than the time I ran Chicago, I just had just short shorts, which were, were fine, but um, I usually wearing compression shorts. Um, I Earlier on, I was racing with the Solomons. Um, the, uh, the just the, ground, right? yeah, yeah, the soft grounds. I was racing those on the, the flatter stuff. Uh, and then after Seattle, I did the BJs. Um, I've act, yeah, and I've just kind of been doing different different shoes here. Like at Utah, I decided to do the uh, uh, Hoka Torrance, the ones I just I tra tra train in. I mean, because like I, 
I kind of need like the terrain looks similar to what I was what I've been training on, and I just figured I'd feel the most comfortable. Um, you know, it was either that or throw on the, the maxes. And even though I had like no, I didn't break them in like at all, really, and just try that. And I was like, no, that's not not what I want to do right now. Were you happy <laughs> so, with the torrents held up on the off road sections? Uh, yeah, you know, they, when it, when it got a, a bit rockier, like when the rocks started getting a little bigger, it did get a little, little sketchy. I felt like my foot was kind of rolling around a little bit, but like, could, like cushion wise, protection wise, it, it felt pretty good. Um, I, I'm just used to, I, I was working on those faster descents, my training with, with those shoes. And I figured I know, you know, I, I knew I was going to be throwing down at Utah on, on the downs and those were the, the shoes that I felt the most confident with um at that time so i figured it'd be best to to rock those and um but i think i think it worked good and i knew you know i, I wasn't sure how they'd feel when they got wet i thought they'd hold water pretty well but um no they i mean they felt fine like, even after the little dunk wall at the end and so are you, are you are you teamed up with any brands or have any sponsors you want to thank for your war, oh, wild success in the sport so far Oh yeah. Um, in Durley, you know, I, I take the perform elite before every hard workout before oh, that, that little turd Matt was supposed to call me today and he didn't. You hear me, Matt? Oh. Uh, yeah, I, I took some of that before and it, it makes me feel amazing. Um, makes me poop easy before race, which is important. Yes, Very <laughs> important. Um, the human octane shorts i was rocking those oh dude uh, that's freaking rock do you have a discount code because i want more of those i maybe i could get you the hook up yeah yeah i love those shirts we're, we're about to get the tights the, the long compression pants will you uh, use in those or just train in them oh both um yeah. i mean I'll, I'll actually train in them more closer to my race just to kind of you know get just gear gear prep make sure i'm good what I'm wearing is good, feels good. Do you use um, the back pocket for anything during the races? Uh, at Utah, I, I did. I, I put a little spring energy in there, but I didn't use it. Um, I just, you know, I didn't feel like I needed to at the time. But, it, and, but yeah, other than that, um, yeah, I usually just, just do like a goo if I, if I, yeah. like Have for my longer training. Any sort? Try what? Have you ever a tried a, a soft bottle or, or a small flask no. of any type? Uh, I don't think I don't know if one will fit in there. I mean, I'd really have to like squeeze it in there. It might, I mean, maybe, maybe if I like left a little like one of the zippers open, but okay. I've never tried that before. That'd be tricky to get it out. Uh, I mean, it, it's a pretty big pocket. My my LG Stylo Four. It's a big phone. It fits in there, um, but it's rubbing against the side. So if you were to try to put a water ball in there, you'd be fighting and putting yeah. an effort into getting it out mid race. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but well, okay. So Tyler, I want to do uh, want to do some uh, quick fire questions with you. Okay, you ready, uh, Bracken? Oh, I'm ready. All right, all right, all right. Tyler. What to date, not counting Utah, because that's easy. You just took third in the national race. Prior to that, what is your or excluding that? What is your uh, your athletic achievement you're most proud of in your life? In my life. Yeah. Uh, Let's see. I mean, oh man, Utah was up there though. <laughs> well, I guess just after like last year, uh, my performance at Spartan Worlds, like it might, you know, it was really good in my eyes. It was just like the first time like I did really well at a at a big race. And my parents were there and you know, they I was we it was pretty emotional for me. Like, you know, I, I wasn't at, like top five or anything, but I I was pretty proud of that. Like you know at that time in my because nice. I, I wasn't racing much I, I did two national races that last year and um you know i did i did top 10 both times but i was like okay like you know i feel pretty good about it but then worlds was was my focus and i think i if i didn't miss the spear i would have probably gotten top 10 but i was really happy with, with yeah. where i was last year and yeah dude anywhere top 20 at tahoe is legit um all right, let's do, uh, if you could have any, who's your dream dinner guest right now? Dinner guest? Mm-hmm. Ooh. Hmm. Well, let's see. I don't know, maybe a celebrity like, uh, 
Tom Hanks or something. Tom Hanks. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting pick. <laughs> All right. If you cannot vote for yourself, who is your pick, men and women, to win Spartan World Championships this year? I would have to say, you know, I think Alvin. Alvin is up there on my list. And I mean, Johnny, Johnny too. Like I, I got to give that, that guy a credit. Like he's, he's been crushing it. And uh, I mean, Alvin, Alvin is also up there on the list. I think he's going to be, he's going to make what, an impact. What about women? Women. Um, Lindsay, I think she's always been doing, doing pretty well. <laughs> and that, that, that's her course. Safe. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's pretty safe. Yeah. With, with what Johnny just did, I, I don't see how Albin's going to beat him, but then again, it's Albin. So there are only yeah. a few people in this sport where I almost any time I bet against them, I'm like, but I will be 0% surprised if they prove me wrong. And that's, that's Hunter Albin and well, kind of just those two actually. I think, the, yeah. I think that Albin should win. He's taken his mountain running to another level again, but his path to losing would come from not knowing who Johnny is. Mm. Yeah. If he's not aware of that nasty skill set Johnny brings. He could, uh, as he normally does at altitude, slow play the race a little too long. Huh. Last year, Atkins almost ran him down on the final descent, which is rare in itself. Um, and I think we can uh, say, safely say now that Johnny's a faster descender than Ryan is. Yeah. So, if he's, he loses, it, I think it would be because he doesn't have a game plan for Johnny, which most likely he won't. Really? Yeah. You know, you think he'll get, especially after this podcast, do you really think he'll get to October without anybody saying, hey, watch Johnny's races? Uh, he, he might, but he strikes me as someone that doesn't care much and not in a lack of uh, respect way, just in a way that he gets out there and he does what he loves and he just doesn't put too much – uh, stress or, or focus on any one thing other than what's the task at hand. And I could just see him saying like, Hey, I, I love what everyone else does, but I'm still just going to go run my own race. Like I always do. And he does that every year. He does not run anyone else's race. Mm -hmm. And Johnny is the first time that someone's had one skill set at this race. that's so far ahead of anyone else's currently that it could cost. Him. I don't know. We'll see. This will this will be, this will be interesting. I, yeah. I'm really, really curious. I can't. Uh, Tyler, uh, one sponsor in the world, anybody, you say it, you're instantly signed. Who is it? Uh, Solomon would be pretty nice. Uh, soon to, soon to. I like the watches are nice. nice. I like that. Okay. Yeah. Solomon's up there. But soon to Favorite food? Uh, ooh, pizza. I like pizza. Good Pizza's call. good. Favorite drink? Uh, oh, it's pretty lame. Water. <laughs> Oh, I drink water. Not the first person I, I drink that. water so much. Like I, I mean, it's pretty. It's pretty much my favorite drink. Like it makes me feel good. So, water. We're gonna we're gonna title this episode the one thing you can drink to be as fast as Tyler Beerman. <laughs> water, <laughs> as quick baby as possible. Cool. Well, Tyler, uh, we're gonna see you. Do you have nothing until Tahoe? Uh, I mean, yeah, that's the plan He's right now. He's ducking me in West Virginia. <laughs> Yeah, I, I didn't really have that on my to do list, but uh, I don't I might I might do a local race out in Colorado, um, okay. kind of towards right in the middle, kind of towards the end of August probably. I don't, I, don't, I don't know which one, but can't get enough of that paintball action. Oh yeah, oh yeah. All right. Cool. All right. Well, dude, Tyler, thanks for coming on. Um, I, we're excited to watch you, uh, watch your career with where it's going. I'm excited every time we have someone new on here that is you know peaking the podium against the against the top athletes i always think about the conversation i have with hunter all the time of you know hunter when you come back to this sport <laughs> it's not going to be what you left it like uh, the amount of new names that are bet you know crushing half of the time the names that you knew before it's it's going to be a smack in the face so um i'm excited to see you throw down with uh be one of those guys that's that's a new name that hunter has never contended with yeah yeah i'd, I'd be excited to see him back again yeah. Wow. But, All right. Before yeah, you go, I can't me. let you off without a an ego question. Honest opinion. What are you going to take at, at Worlds? Uh, top five. Ooh. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Top five. Like, I like for it. sure. I believe it too. Hell yeah. I will not be shocked at all if you do that.
Dude, that's so crazy to be able to say that. <laughs> it gets me like excited hearing your confidence. Like that gets me pumped up. Yeah. Yeah. I I know it's it's possible. I know I'm gonna work for it, but Hell yeah, man. I'm, I'm gonna put myself up there. So. Well, right. we're excited to uh to watch you top five. I'll be there. I won't be racing, but uh I'll be there. We'll be doing our our pood casting, so we might have to snag you post race and uh get a little interview. Of course, of course. Thanks guys for having yeah. us. Thanks, thanks everybody for listening. Tyler, thanks for coming on. And uh, oh, I, I guess we didn't say this earlier. I called Bracken Killian earlier. For anybody who's just listening, um, Bracken has changed his name to Robert Killian on the video, and I'm VJ Jones because apparently, I don't know, that's who we look like. So, anyways, just filling in gaps. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna wrap that up with a nice bow, Benny. <laughs> a little random edit. Okay, see you guys. Visit ObstacleDominator.com for show notes, training, and racing resources, and leave your question for Benny and Bracken.